Hi, this is Stephen Mead, lifelong entrepreneur, business owner, and global speaker. Over the years, I've read hundreds of books and spent thousands of hours developing what I call the bullseye belief system. And I've used that system to develop my own companies, as well as help others learn to be specific, targeted, and focused to get exactly what they want in life. Again, I'm Stephen Mead, and this is the Bullseye Guy podcast. Stephen Mead again, back, the Bullseye Guy, and... This episode, we're going to talk crypto again. We're going to talk Facebook Libra, which is patently in the news right now. Um, Not only is it in the news because the politicians are freaked out, uh, it's also in the news because Trump came out and conflated, I love that word, conflated, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin along with Facebook Libra. And to me, they're not even the same. Uh, So we're going to do a little educational component of what's going on in the real world with where I believe Facebook's going to end up with Libra. And again, the the good news with the podcast is I get to get my information out there, my insights, my predictions. The bad news is I get to get my information, insights, and predictions out. So we'll see what happens a a year or two from now. We'll be able to look back on this in in posterity and, and kind of see where it landed. But Facebook Libra, a lot of talk around it. If, if you're following the, the space at all, even if you're not, you see a lot with, with Facebook. And uh, I'm going to back up and let's talk about a couple things that have happened in the past, some other things that are going on currently. And I think that'll help us understand Libra a little bit better. And then sort of the, the state of the investing crypto market, which to me is always fascinating. Uh, Facebook years ago did two things. We're going to talk about the first one. Facebook created something called Facebook credits. And what Facebook credits were, is exactly as it sounds, they were basically credits that you could buy inside Facebook to spend on things that were in the platform, kind of like games. So if you were playing games inside of Facebook or, or trying to buy little things for a while, they had a garden with stickers. There was different things you could buy. And the theory of Facebook credits was you put $100 in and they give you $100 worth of credits to go buy things. And it's 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 really that simple. It's a credit inside a closed system. Think about as we fast forward, uh, I think many of us have used this now, at least I have, it's a great convenience, is Starbucks. Starbucks has a, a, a beautiful thing called a Starbucks card. It's a gift card, right? I can put $25, $50, $100 dollars on it and give it to somebody. Think about it for a moment. What is that Starbucks card? It's a type of digital payment. Now, do we want to call it a cryptocurrency? Not exactly, but there's a hundred dollars that exists somewhere. And when your card is presented, that money is then deposited into Starbucks. And then when you fast forward to today, they've actually got a beautiful mobile app, a little clunky when you kind of order and check out. But at the end of the day, you can check out with your phone at Starbucks. You just present your mobile device and the money's sucked right out and given to Starbucks. Let's back up. That money's not given to Starbucks when you present your phone. That money was given to Starbucks when you gave them $100 to load onto your phone. That money's not yours, it's Starbucks. Why is that important? Starbucks has an estimated $1.2 billion of consumers' money sitting in their bank because we, for the convenience, have given them our $100 to load our Starbucks card or our mobile app for the convenience of paying at the restaurant, paying at the counter. Starbucks is sitting on that money. They've got their own little digital currency. They don't call it a Libra, but it is the same type of system where the money is sitting there and being moved around within the Starbucks network. Facebook's a type of network, not quite like a Starbucks with a retail store, but hopefully you can kind of cross that little bridge to see it's a marketplace. I'll give you another kind of marketplace. And if you've used this app, it's great. I use it. We, we have to use a bunch of them. We're on every app on the planet when they come out because we like to, to test and break things. But there's a cool, fun little app out there called WeChat. Now, I don't know if you've ever used WeChat. WeChat was fascinating. It's owned by a company called Tencent out of China. Really, really took off in, in Asia. And they've done an amazing job with it. And I think some of it they've invented on their own. Some of it mm, they probably haven't. Um, I'll I'll digress for a moment here and tell a joke. Hopefully it it won't be 
held against me. But many years ago, I was at a, an event in South Korea, and I was sitting at my table. I was very lucky and very fascinated. My table was uh, Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas and the President of Korea and Sumner Redstone, and it was on digital piracy. And Sumner Redstone and, and Will I Am were about to go speak on stage about the concept of digital piracy and how things were getting stolen. And I looked at the table and with a deadpan look, I go, well, I don't understand what you're worried about. The Chinese, of course, they believe in copyright. Of course, they believe in copyright. And everybody's looking at me incredulously. And I know this is radio. You can't see it. Maybe you'll watch the video. And as I said it the third time, I'm shaking my head vigorously up and down in the form of, yes, copy, right? copy, right? Meaning the Chinese like to copy things. That was, that was the joke. Not that they protect it, they copy it. Now, where does that bring us? Back to WeChat. WeChat's fascinating. It's a great little mobile app. It's a network. It does a lot of things socially. It does some cool things Facebook does, but a lot it doesn't. But within WeChat, we have WeChat Mobile Pay. What is Mobile Pay? We give WeChat our money. They give us some WeChat credits. And we can send those credits to our friends if we owe them money. There's some merchants that will like actually accept it because WeChat does. And there's a little fee. WeChat makes a little bit of money in there. The merchant gets paid in the WeChat credits. It's basically a type of a digital currency. How much money is WeChat sitting on from the tens and hundreds of millions of WeChat users? We don't know. What does that have to do with Facebook? Well, Facebook also owns another fun little app that was really taken off out of Europe. Uh, Facebook bought it for, I believe, 17 billion, yes, billion with a B, dollars. And that's called WhatsApp. Now, not everybody realizes Facebook owns WhatsApp. WhatsApp, again, great tool, very competitive and similar to WeChat. What's missing in WhatsApp? There's no payment mechanism. You pay $17 billion for a mobile app that people use for free. You might want to figure out how to make some money on it. So Facebook Libra trying to come full circle. To me, I think Facebook Libra is really going to be much more of an internal payment mechanism, much more competitive to something like a WeChat that has mobile pay or even like a gift card at a Starbucks. To me, it's not a cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrencies are things that are tradable tokens. And I'll, I'll cover that in a minute. It's more like a, a glorified penny stock. The Facebook Libra is really what's called a stable coin. A stable coin is nothing more than a glorified credit. A glorified credit is nothing more than when you put money on a gift card. If I put $100 on a gift card with American Express, I can use that card at certain merchants. And in some cases, I can actually email somebody a hundred dollar digital gift certificate from American Express and I have sent them a digital payment or a digital currency or a stable coin. They're all the same thing. So again, part of what I try and do on some of these podcasts is demystify what's going on in the industry. Cause I'm just, I'm flabbergasted and frustrated when I watch people on the news conflate things together. Oh, fake Facebook's launching a cryptocurrency and they're going to take out the banks and it's all about money laundering and terrorism. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. This is a digital payment inside a closed network. It's like a glorified gift card. All right. And this just recently happened with Donald Trump. Some of you love Donald Trump. Some of you hate Donald Trump. We will not go into politics here. Uh, I do personally know how to separate politics, personality, and policy. Uh, but again, this isn't a political talk, so we will... We will refrain from that, but but Trump, you know, to to his credit and detriment again, likes to throw things out there in the ethos and see what happens. And he conflated digital cryptocurrency and Bitcoin to Facebook Libra. And he basically said, and I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the quote, but they don't work. They don't make sense. They need to be regulated. They'll never work. It was, again, it probably wasn't that basic, but sometimes it is. Facebook... Libra and Bitcoin are different. I think we've covered it before. Bitcoin to me is like a, a, a piece of gold, right? Just think of it that simple. It's not a cryptocurrency. It's I can go buy a brick of gold, which I probably wouldn't and wish I could. A brick of gold is $500,000. And a current Bitcoin unit, if you were to buy a whole one, is about $9,000. I can go buy a $50 gold coin. 
or I can buy $50 worth of a Bitcoin. It's a unit. It's an asset. Bitcoin and gold to me are similar. And I get this all the time. When you talk about cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies to me are like glorified penny stocks. And the reason I use penny stocks is penny stocks are the bulletin board. It's the wolf of Wall Street. Some of them work. A lot of them don't. A lot of it is speculation and hype. You can buy a 25 cent stock on the OTC bulletin board and you buy it because you hope it goes to 50 cents. And you can buy a 25 cent crypto token, cryptocurrency, even though it's not a currency, it's a token. You can buy a 25 cent crypto token and hope it goes to 50 cents. You're not putting $100 in Starbucks hoping it goes to $200. So there's a clear distinction between a digital payment and a cryptocurrency where, to my mind, the currencies aren't trying to be currencies. The, again, the news and the audience and the industry has conflated things and confused all of the marketing. So blockchain, I'm not going to talk about it. Gold. Gold is a unit of value. Stocks go up and down based on really two simple things. Speculation, which drives supply and demand. How many people want it versus how many willing to sell it. What drives speculation a lot of times is profit or potential. Now, down at the penny stocks, the OTC, the bulletin board, these are the smaller companies. They're much more risky, but there's, there's more potential. It's easier for a stock on a bulletin board to go from 25 cents to 50 cents to a dollar than it is for Amazon to go from 1,500 to 3,000 to 6,000. Amazon's less risky but there's also less reward. This is where when we talk about how do you define what you want to do, how do you understand what's going on in the industry to make better decisions, stocks have different levels of risk. Investment has different level of risk. Again, this is not an investment presentation. I'm not trying to solicit investments. I'm trying to, to provide an education. Where does this go? I like to go forward and come back. We're full circle. Facebook Libra technically is a type of stable coin. Bitcoin is completely different. So when Trump put those two together, he did a disservice to what I think is going on within the industry. And what I like to say, people go, oh, well, Bitcoin doesn't do anything. Bitcoin has no value. It's thin air. It doesn't do anything. There's no equity. And I look at him and I say, how many employees does gold have? And I'm quiet. And people look at me and they think I'm joking. I'm like, well, no. How many employees does gold have? What was the profit? What was the P&L? What's the projected revenue? What's the dividend return on gold? Gold has none of that. Gold is an asset. We think it has value because we've been tricked, coerced, convinced, whatever it is through the eons of our history of a civilization, we think gold has value. And as long as we as a civilization continue to think it has value, it will. Gold is separate than stock. So when we look at it, we need to separate these things out. And that's where we talk about stable coin, which is going on within the blockchain industry right now, versus cryptocurrency, versus stocks, versus this new animal. Again, this is educational of what's called an STO and an SEO and a DPO and an IEO. That was a lot of alphabet soup. Right? I'm going to break those down because you will start hearing these things thrown about in the vernacular of the technology industry. So let's back up and let's sort of build on it. DPO, IPO. So IPO exists for primarily big companies that want to go public. Again, simple education. You usually have to be around eight to 10 years, have $100 million or more. You go public as an effort to raise more money. You get shareholders. Uber is a great example. I have great friends that invested in Uber. They were some of the first investors. It took them 11 years to get their money out. On paper, they look great, but for a long time, they couldn't do much with it. I have other investors and friends that invested in other things that they thought would be Uber and wasn't. Again, it's all a risk. But an IPO, initial public offering, is usually for big companies that take a long time and have a lot of revenue. Along came this 
other opportunity called a DPO. And we don't hear much about DPOs. DPOs are a direct public offering. The difference between an initial public offering and a direct public offering is in a direct public offering, you as the business owner decide to sell the stock directly to usually your customer base. So we'll start seeing these more and more. Somebody like a like a, a Jay-Z with 40 million followers, somebody like a Justin Bieber in the, the music industry. There's social tools that exist now that allow you to communicate directly with a customer who likes your product or service. Well, usually in an initial public offering, you have a bunch of bankers and layers of people who have the investors and they're trying to push all of this to market. A direct public offering sort of just lets you say, hey, I'm gonna sell direct to the consumer, what's called a retail client, but if you have a base of fans, if you have a base of customers that love your product, you can do it. And a market to do that on is called an OTC. It's a bulletin board. It's over the counter. And these are smaller companies, less revenue. They're technically called penny stocks because they're usually in the values below a dollar. All right. And this all exists. This isn't fanciful. This is just the world of finance broken down very simply. So I could go do, if I choose to, and I've done three, I've had three public companies, I could go do a public offering on a bulletin board and I could try and go public by selling stock directly to a public through a bulletin board, the US. This new animal in the blockchain world came out and was called an ICO. I love it, it was a, a takeoff of the IPO, initial public offering. ICO stood for initial coin offering. And again, it was all confusing because nobody knew what it was. I looked at it and went, oh, it's a glorified penny stock. It's a direct public offering. You're basically, instead of selling a stock on an exchange like the OTC, the over-the-counter market, to a consumer, you're selling a token as opposed to a stock on an exchange like Binance or Bittrex as opposed to the bulletin board, and you're selling direct to the consumer. The difference is the exchange offerings, the, uh, the ICOs came with a lot less restrictions, but also with a lot less regulation. So as you can imagine, there's been some, some bad actors within that market, but any of you that think there aren't bad actors and everything, go watch the Wolf of Wall Street. Go do a little investigation of penny stocks. You know, go look at the Toronto Stock Exchange. I love the TSX, but it's the wild, wild west out there. Everybody's got a gold mine that's about to strike it rich. And some of them do, most of them don't. Again, it's all risky. It's all a matter of, of, of opportunity. And where the industry again gets confused is ICOs were sort of direct public offerings. It was an opportunity for a company to sell a token direct to their consumer. And then came the trick. The big, big question within the blockchain world. When you started out, this was nine months ago, a year ago, 15 months ago. Are you a utility or a security? And again, hopefully for those of you that like this side of the industry, this is educational. But if I were doing a token, the question was, are you a utility or a security? And the distinction was supposedly very simple. Utility. You buy a token that you could use within a network. So there, there's a lot of classic examples. The best one is um, for an amusement park. Hey, give me... You know, $50, I'll give you $50 worth of tokens. And when I finally build the amusement park, you can come in and spend the tokens in the amusement park. You know, I like the the example of, of a restaurant gift card. That one to me made more sense is give me $25 for a gift card for a restaurant. And if I get the restaurant built, you can come in and I'll give you $50 worth of value. We've all seen that in gift cards, right? Spend 25, get 30 or $40 worth of value within the restaurant. That's the way these utility tokens were supposed to work. So if you believed in a company, they were building software, they were building a video platform, you could buy a token that had a utility value within the network. That's all it meant. Security token meant you were investing or giving money in that token for the purpose and premise of making money. Well, that to me, again, I, I use the phrase I call retrospective evolution. When I started hearing this floating around in the industry and all of the blockchain babble, people were running around like this had never been invented. I'm like, guys, it's a glorified penny stock. 
If I give you 25 cents, I hope I sell it for 50 cents. That's the difference. It had no equity, though, so people got a little confused. Again, security tokens. There was no equity. Fascinating. As an entrepreneur, you could raise money, give away a token as opposed to stock, but the consumer got no equity in your company. Now, there's probably some advantages or disadvantages. Within the penny stock world, though, I was very pragmatic about it. If I pay 25 or 50 cents for a stock, I don't care that it has equity. I do. Equity is a fallacy. I buy that stock at 25 cents, hoping it goes to a dollar. If that thing fails, I'm so far down the list as an investor, I don't get any money. Equity is a fallacy. And I say that in New York a lot and the people just, they're, they're, their hackles go up. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I do. I've had a company, went bankrupt. We lost it. We didn't get anything back. Even though we had equity, the investment opportunity is, can you buy something that goes up in value? And so the security tokens for a while, probably a year in the blockchain world, that's what security meant. Are you a utility or a security? Utility meant it had value in a network. Security meant it was going to go up. But the industry realized that wasn't going to work. I realized it uh, November of 2017 when I started looking and I'm like, this stuff's stupid. Doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to deny that the market's moving that way, but it was kind of didn't make sense. So the brainiacs have gotten around and now there's a new term out there called an STO, which is still called a security token offering. Well, nine months ago, a security token offering meant you invest in a security that you think is going to go up. And it, it had certain regulations and restrictions, especially in the U.S. that we had to deal with. The new security token is now called a security token, but now it's tied to equity. So we're in an industry that was already confusing people to begin with, and they weren't smart enough to name a new security token different than the security token that was different than what it was nine months ago when they don't want to be called a security to begin with because they don't want to be regulated. That's how dumb this industry is right now. So you had a security token that meant you invest because it goes up. Now you rename a security token a security token and tie it to equity so you think you can be different. But the minute you tie a security to equity, you're a stock. So we basically are going full circle in this industry around tokens. And that's where it starts to get confusing. And it shouldn't be. And so this direct public offering, the new term that you may start hearing, instead of an ICO, initial coin offering, you won't hear direct public offering because that's really on the stock side. The new term coming out is an IEO and an internet or initial exchange offering. And to me, these are pretty cool and fascinating. All an IEO exchange offering, it means is the actual exchange platform itself will take on the marketing of your token to their customers. So again, it's kind of like a direct public offering, but instead of you having your own customers to market to, the exchange, you know, Bill and the guys at Bittrex or, or, or CZ and Binance, these big global token exchanges have hundreds of thousands or millions of existing users on the platform, investors who are clearly there to invest. They're there for the premise of making money. They're already qualified and accredited and have gone through a bunch of the legal requirements and systems that you don't necessarily get or are able to do on your own. And if a, an exchange can say, hey, we like your company, we're going to promote it to a million people for you, that's an IEO. That's an initial exchange offering where the token goes out on an exchange for marketing, a direct public offering as you market to your customers, an initial public offering as a bunch of banks market to their customers. That's all this is. The, the distinctions aren't any more difficult or different than that. The benefit, though, of a token is it gives you a lot of liquidity. If you have a stock, it's difficult to register it. It's hard to transfer it around. If I own fifteen or $1,800 worth of Amazon, you know, if I own one stock, which nobody's going to sell me one stock of Amazon, but if they did and I owed somebody $200, I can't send them $200 worth of Amazon. I can't fractionalize out a stock. A crypto asset can be fractionalized. Again, so this is where I go back to Bitcoin. Bitcoin's $9,000. If you want to send somebody $50, $80, $100, $200, I 
as a fraction of that, you can. So there's some interesting structural advantages around digital tokens. There's what's called liquidity. And again, I'm trying to be educational. Liquidity means if I'm on the OTC, again, we're in America, the bulletin board, the over-the-counter. Over-the-counter has a certain amount of liquidity. Liquidity is defined as the number of people that are there buying, buying and selling, volume. And the next level up is the American Stock Exchange and then NASDAQ and then the Dow Jones. Like those are the behemoths. And as you move up, there's more volume, more liquidity. But they also have a trade cycle. They're open a certain amount. They're closed a certain amount. They're closed on holidays. There's some trading at night, but not a whole lot. Crypto markets are really fascinatingly different. They're traded on a 24-hour cycle, seven days a week. And then there's ones that are specialized. Binance is the behemoth right now. It's done really well. But you've got Bittrex and the guys out of Seattle that are coming online in Malta to do more stuff internationally. You have CoinSuper and the team out of Hong Kong. They focused on that Hong Kong Asian market. And there's two or three exchanges just in Hong Kong. And there's a couple in Korea and there's a few down in the Bahamas. The beautiful part of the token economy is you could have your token, almost like your stock, but you could have it listed on multiple exchanges, multiple jurisdictions, multiple continents, and it's traded 24 hours a day, seven days a week in different jurisdictions, potentially giving you more liquidity. But just being on an exchange doesn't give you liquidity. I could go list on, on, on Binance tomorrow, which is, again, the, the big one. I could also go create a public company and go list on the bulletin board, the OTC in the U.S. I could do the same. If nobody knows about my stock or nobody knows about my token, if I don't have something going on behind it for momentum or actually have a company with profits and revenue and growing, that just sits there. There's a bunch of dead stocks on the, the OTC bulletin board. There's a bunch of dead stocks in crypto. And by a bunch, I need to be fair. There's less in crypto than there are in the bulletin board. As much as people think, oh, crypto's down, it's there's less than 2,000 tokens that have ever been issued in, in crypto. There's probably under 1,000 that aren't really working. They're dead. They're zombies. They may or may not recover. There's thousands of them. In the U.S. alone, there's millions worldwide. So this market around liquidity is twofold. The exchanges give you some liquidity for trading, but it's your job to generate that liquidity if you're actually trying to do a public offering. So last part, there's some cool legal structures we think are coming out in the blockchain world. One of them we helped pioneer and create it. It may work, it may not. Again, we'll know six, 12, nine months from now, uh, but it's this concept of a liquidity token. Again, notice it's not called a security token. If you don't want to be a security, don't call yourself something you don't want to be. I'm just baffled again by the industry. Um, but there's a lot of movement now towards, again, retrospective evolution. People are going back to, as an investor, again, I'm talking entrepreneurial here, they're going back to wanting equity. Well, there's some benefits with equity. Equity gives you compliance and guidance and long-term, and it's a six, eight, 10 years. If you had invested in Uber, that's great. You would be an investor 11 years later, you could get out. Majority of companies fail for equity. If you're a startup investor, nine out of 10 fail. It's a risk, but equity gives you some compliance, some guidance, but that's the traditional retrospective way of how people know how to exist and invest. A liquidity token attached to an equity investment is a new financial structure that we think will be interesting to see what happens. It basically says if somebody invests in equity in your company, you're going to give them equity. Traditional, a liquidity token is a crypto token that could then be listed on an exchange. So you might have equity at 50 cents, a token at 50 cents, or divorce. They're separated. They're not security. They're not tied together. That liquidity token could be listed on an exchange. Bitrix International, Malta, OKX, CoinSuper could be traded. If your investor holds both, they have liquidity and they have their equity, which could give them liquidity years later. The investors, the retail customers who love your product, get liquidity early. If Uber had done this type of situation and taken a token out early, not only would they have billions of dollars more, a lot of people who love Uber would have been able to invest and participate in the success of Uber. You don't get that opportunity as an investor because you don't get that opportunity until Uber goes public at $47.
you weren't one of the people that had access to it at a dollar. More risky at a dollar, but more reward if you like the service. Tokens to me are fascinating. I think the world's going to change around the way we structure new financial instruments. That's what I was excited about today. So, again, thanks for joining today on the Bullseye Guy podcast. I'm Steve Amid. For more information on this program, please visit my website, www.thebullseyeguy.com. Again, Steve Amid and thebullseyeguy.com.